All right, so I do want to welcome my friends who are watching online, and of course, I, I just pray you feel loved today, that you know that the Lord has you. Everybody's fighting a battle, right? If you're not in one, that means you've just come out of one or you're headed for one in some time, and I'm not trying to be discouraging, quoting Jesus, really, paraphrasing, when he said the night before he would be crucified to his closest friends, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So I want to make sure you've gotten the notes from uh, to fill in the blank in the back um, so that you can have these to take home and study on your own. So what I want to do before we get into the actual armor of God next week, and we'll start off with the belt of truth, um, I want to give you one more introduction. It's extremely important. Because it's easy to focus primarily on the armor without realizing a very, very critical biblical principle. So I don't know if we have any J.R.R. Tolkien fans here, uh, Lord of the Rings. I remember my professor from, who taught from Oxford. I'll never forget it when he told us, of course, this is the beauty of online learning. But when he said this past Sunday at church... I was able to visit with Tolkien's granddaughter, and I just thought, holy mackerel, can you imagine that? So, Tolkien, in the second installment of The Lord of the Rings, the King of Rohan, their uh, area of Middle Earth had been ravaged by war, but now it's time to go to war again. And Theoden, the King of Rohan, says, I will not risk open war. Aragorn the soon-to-be king, looks at him and says, open war is upon you whether you would risk it or not. Now, I want you to remember that. I remember the Pirates of the Caribbean, remember the first one, and Barbosa, who was the nemesis, you know, uh, the, um, the person who was against Johnny Depp. And after we see that the, his crew is actually ghosts, he looks at them and says, you best be believing in ghost stories. You're in one. And so the principle here is that we are in a, I'll get to those next week, <laughs> pretty funny, but we are in a spiritual war. And so let's look at these, uh, these verses one more time. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. Paul, in closing this letter, to the believers at Ephesus who live in this city that is primarily um, uh, dominated by sorcery, by pagan gods, the goddess Diana slash Artemis, the, one of the wonders of the ancient world. Um, he says, look, in the midst of all this um, spiritual worship of demons, remember to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes and then he reminds them for our struggle is not against flesh and blood in other words he's saying look your struggle is not against the authorities in Ephesus but against the rulers against the authorities against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Chrysostom, the 4th century church father, theologian, he said the first art in tactics is to know how to stand firmly from this firmness, all else follows. But it's not us standing, and this is your introduction. We're not putting on armor. We're putting on Christ. And that's the principle that will be the theme of this lesson today, man. We're not putting on armor. We're putting on Christ. Armor is merely a metaphor. And I've heard sermons and um, been in classes where as this passage is taught, there is a lot of focus on the armor. 
what it looked like on the ancient Roman soldiers, and, and we'll show that, but we won't spend much time there. But the armor is Christ. Paul has spent much of his letter, he spends the same thing in Colossians, Philippians, to put off the old self and to put on the new self, which is Christ Jesus. Because we have that muscle memory, right, which wants to go back to our old ways. So even though the battle pieces of armor um, are like the armor worn by a Roman soldier, we need to quickly recognize that the armor is Christ. You, you may remember, you may not. Early on in chapter 1, I reminded you, in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul uh, addresses this letter to the faithful, to the holy people who are in Christ Jesus. Man, he sets the theme from the very beginning. We saw or remember that we looked at how many times in the letter to the Ephesians, if you take a highlighter or a pen, and every time you read in Christ Jesus, in Christ, through Christ, in him, by whom, in whom, through whom, through him, you'll spend a good deal of that highlighter or that pen, man. His whole point, as he gets to this in closing is that this armor is not some uh, a piece of armor, man. It is Christ, all of Christ. So what I want to do is just remind you of three basic R's of spiritual warfare. It doesn't matter if you want to be in a spiritual battle. You're in one, right? And so remember to recognize it is a spiritual battle. That's your first R. Recognize it is a spiritual battle. Remember, Paul said, our struggle is not against one another. It is against those powers in the heavenly realms. Throughout Scripture, stories are repeatedly shared that tell us the truth that the spirit realm exists. There is the supernatural, the metaphysical. So there's this story in 2 Kings. The king of Syria is furious with the prophet Elisha. Now, of course, he took the mantle from Elijah, but then Elisha begins to be that prophet. The king of Syria is furious because he can't seem to sneak up on Israel because Elisha is always a step ahead of him as God is giving him wisdom to predict what the enemy is going to do. And so the king of Syria gets mad and he sends soldiers to take Elisha prison or prisoner or, at worst, to kill him. So Elisha is there in his tent somewhere off, and it, his attendant goes out in the morning to get the paper or whatever they do in the morning back then, right? And so it says Elisha's attendant got up early in the morning, and when he went outside, there was an army from Syria surrounding the city along with horses and chariots. Surrounding the city, so there's, there's a lot of them. It's, it's pretty imposing. The servant runs back in. He says to Elisha, Oh no, my master, what will we do? Elisha replied, Don't be afraid. For our side outnumbers them. Then Elisha prayed. It's huge. That's one of the pieces of armor, man. Then he prayed. Oh, Lord, open my servant's eyes so he can see. The Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw that the hill was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha, filled with mighty angels. The spirit realm exists. We remember maybe last week in Revelation 12, and I pointed out in Revelation 12, we're given just a tiny piece of information in regard to Satan's being cast out of heaven, right? And it says, and there was war in heaven. And then we have this passage from the Old Testament. Now, Daniel has already been um, visited by the angel Gabriel, which must have been very, fairly terrifying. The first six chapters of Daniel are narrative. You have the story of the fiery furnace and Daniel in the lion's den and the handwriting on the wall. The last six chapters, six chapters, we turn to more uh, prophetic slash apocalyptic literature. And Daniel in chapter 10 has already been interrupted by one angel as he was praying. 
And so he's praying again for the nation of Israel. An unidentified angel comes in swift flight, interrupts Daniel, and he says, Daniel, do not be afraid. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to them. You think your prayers don't matter? Think again. Verse 13. Look what the angel of God says. But the prince of the Persian kingdom, this is a supernatural context, a demon prince of the Persian kingdom, resisted me 21 days. And then Michael, the archangel, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. What a war. Can you imagine being able to see into the spirit realm? Can you imagine being able to see into it right now? Verse 14, the angel says, Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people, the nation of Israel, in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. So because the battle is at its root spiritual, physical weapons are of no value. Look what Paul wrote to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. He said, For though we live as human beings, we do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons of our warfare are not human weapons, but are made powerful by God. By whom? By God. For tearing down strongholds. Some of us, perhaps even in here, just can't shake. Maybe some bitterness, some anger, some impatience, um, uh, uh, lust. Um, it could be anything. Um, and we're thinking, why can't I shake that? Probably because we're fighting with the wrong weapons. He said... We tear down arguments, verse 5, and every arrogant obstacle that is raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to make it to obey Christ. Now, i got to tell you, I think it was Wednesday. It was Wednesday. And it's typical, it's very common, uh, when I prepare for any type of lesson that exposes the enemy. Now, we always preach the cross, the blood, the, the, the resurrection, the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. He's, he's the backbone of every single message out of Scripture. But then there are those particular passages that actually exposes who he is, what he's doing, and it reminds him of how he was humiliatingly defeated by the cross of Christ. And it's typically during those times I am met with more temptation, uh, more ungodly thoughts. Um, it just becomes a harder week than normal. Distraction, impatience, you know, bits of anger. Anyway, on Wednesday, I thought to myself, I hadn't had any of that. The day's going pretty darn good. About two hours later, he hit. I mean, and he hit hard. It affected me greatly until Friday. What he did, he can't touch me. He can't touch you. But he can come in from the flank, throw a cheap shot, and just try to weaken our faith. And my faith was weakened, man. I was upset. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't prepare. And that's exactly what he wanted. Now, did I just rush and, and begin to pray and, and use the right weapon? Of course not. I'm just like you. No, I'm mad. I want to take care of it, and I want to fix it. And I finally remembered, I cannot fight with physical weapons. They're of no value. I just went to my knees. And I was still too mad to pray. And so I just started quoting scripture. 
That's all I could do. And the evil began abating. Now, it didn't change my circumstances. What I was mad about was still there, but it changed me. You know, that's Jesus when he told Peter, Satan has asked permission to sift you as wheat. Notice, Jesus never told Peter, I've not given Satan permission. (laughs) What he did say, I've prayed that your faith will remain strong. These things happen. And he comes in like a flood. And he deceives. And he, he tries to get us to focus on anything but the weapons of our warfare. And to appropriate the Holy Spirit that is within us. And to allow that spirit to fill and control us. So, with physical weapons being of no value, it's no wonder Charles Hodge, who's theologian from over well over a century ago said he therefore who rushes into conflict with Satan without thinking of Christ without putting his or her trust in him and without continually looking to him for strength is demented when we are weak then we are strong when most empty of self we are most full of God I think to the passage we just read out of Daniel 10. Do you remember what the angel said? Because you have humbled yourself. Because you have humbled yourself. Daniel had emptied himself of himself and allowed the Holy Spirit of God to fill him and control him. Willpower is impotent. (laughs) Social media is worse. And Congress, I don't even have a word for that. But, you know, it's interesting because there are those people who think every four years there's going to be some savior to fill the Oval Office who's going to fix our country. And our country is unfixable. It will not be set straight until the king returns, right? So when you are attacked, recognize who your enemy is really is that you're in a spiritual battle number two resist is the second r don't take the bait satan was baiting me on wednesday now folks i'll tell you a secret (laughs) i've told you before i was raised in a horrifically violent alcoholic home alcohol finally killing my dad he was 57 So, my dad was a very, very angry man. And I love him. I I love him. I love him. I don't want to disparage his name. And I look forward to seeing him one day without an addiction. I've told you before, you teach what you know but you reproduce what you are. Now that should send chills into the heart of every parent or mentor. So I grew up an angry man, and I was never violent, ever. But what I would do, anger would suffocate me, and I would shut down, become dissociative. And so... I entered counseling. I want to tell you men something. <laughs> We're going to get off just a second. Uh, counseling is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of real strength. And I'm just like you. I was I was threatened, uh, not uh, at the uh, expense of death, but I was told you need some help. And I learned real quickly. Um, first of all, I said, like any guy, what good is that going to do? The Lord led me to a man who the Lord used to change my life. In fact, he's the one who the Lord used to help me forgive my dad, and that changed everything. I tell people, uh, next to my decision 
to profess my faith in Jesus Christ, no other decision has so changed my life than when I forgave my dad. So when Satan, remember that muscle memory? <laughs> we come back to that a lot. When he fire, fires his arrows, we'll get to that with the shield of faith. But every arrow is tailor-made for a particular weakness of a particular person. The arrow he fires at me is not going to be the arrow he fires at, fires at you. But don't you know, many times he'll bait me with anger. And I'll tell you what. One of the first things I'll go to is my first ever memory verse from high school. Psalm 37 8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. It only leads to evil doing. And you know what? When you go to the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, Satan has no defense. So, that was free. <laughs> if you ever need help, guys, just get it. Just humble yourself and get it. It's worth the time. I put up here, James 4, 7, when we talk about resist, you probably think primarily about resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But that's only half the verse. Context is everything. Now, this is James, the half-brother of Jesus. We do know from context, none of his brothers or sisters believed when Jesus first began his ministry that he was the Messiah. I mean, they've grown up with him, right? Familiarity breeds contempt. I mean, sure, he... Never did anything wrong, right? But this is just Jesus. It's the reason um, that we are given those quotes when the neighbors say, that this, is, this is Joseph's son, man. There's his brothers and sisters. I mean, are you kidding me? And with Jesus' humanity on display. Jesus was just like us, and he was nothing like us. It's that what theologians call the hypostatic union. It's the incarnation. He was not 50% man and 50% God. He was 100% us and 100% not us. Don't try to understand that. Don't waste your time going down that rabbit hole, man. But his half-brother James, at some point, professed his faith in his half-brother as the Messiah. In fact, he started off the letter by talking about temptation, right? And he started off by saying, consider it pure joy when you encounter these various trials. And then in verse 14, he says, but look, each one is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desires. Then... When desire conceives, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. Taking the bait always ends badly. Always. Every fisherman, professional fisherman, someone who's fished for a long time, I've told you before, they, create, they choose a lure that is um, appropriate for a particular fish, right? Right? And that's what Satan will do with us. But that's why James begins James 4, this James 4, 7 with submit therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil in Christ's strength and his might. That's what submit therefore to God means. It's interesting because the word submit is a military term. So we find this imagery really throughout the New Testament. Paul is using military imagery, but so did James here. It's, it's, to, it's to know your place. It's to submit to authority, to yield, to, to know that you are under authority. And so when Satan comes in and he, 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 he offers a cheap shot, man, don't just barrel out like many of us guys do. I'll take care of this. <laughs> We're just going to mess it up worse, man. But stop and be still and submit, therefore, to God. Remember our place. Count to ten or count to three hundred, however long it may take, man. But submit, therefore, to God. That's why Paul started out this passage was to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Know your place, man. 
Don't go in on your own strength. Physical weapons are of no value. It will end badly. I have a devotional book in my library called Streams in the Desert. It's, it's very, very good. Written by a couple who were missionaries. One of the entries says, Evil never surrenders its grasp without a fight. Every person who wins their spiritual freedom does so at the cost of blood. Satan is not put to flight by our courteous request. Right? And so when he comes in, man, it's not about going, you know, I wish you'd leave me alone. Man, it is about going to war. No, it's about recognizing we're in a war, right? And it's putting on not armor, but putting on Christ and admitting to him, I can't do this, Lord. I can't do it. I am going to, I'm going to say something when we get in a, a an argument with our spouse or a, a co-worker or a child, man, and all of a sudden we're baited. And what do we do? We say things we don't mean and we do things we're going to regret. We do the same thing in the rest of life. It's, it's the way we're bent, to quote a phrase by C.S. Lewis. And so that's why uh, James uh, is uh, reiterating what Paul is saying, man. Submit therefore to God. Take a deep breath. Go for a walk. Remember our place. Place ourselves under the authority of the Almighty Christ. Am I right about it? Let me give you a case study for not submitting to God. It's interesting because this case study is the only Old Testament character described in the New Testament as a man after God's own heart. Who would that be? David. Yeah. We remember Bathsheba, right? And we all know, had she been taking a shower, her name would be Shower Sheba. But she was taking a bath, and so her name is Bathsheba. But you remember, here's David, and it starts off the chapter in 2 Samuel 11. In the spring, when kings have gone off to war, what's David doing at home? He's already, man, just setting himself up. He should be somewhere else. When I was a youth pastor, and when he would have events, maybe camp or an overnight event, a discipleship weekend, my first rule or principle was be where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. That will cover a multitude of sins. Well, David wasn't where he was supposed to be when he was supposed to be there. And he no doubt had seen Bathsheba many times. And Satan attached himself to that lust. And then David follows through with this despicable act. And that continues with not only getting her pregnant, but having her husband murdered. And then we come to 1 Chronicles chapter 21, 1 through 7. Now this is an interesting, the way that, that the historians... Um, phrase this. David has won so many battles because he has remembered his place. He's a king, but he's a servant, right? He has forgotten his place. All of a sudden, he's just pretty proud of himself. And so he decides to go off to war in his own strength. How did I say that was going to turn out? Badly. But it's interesting the way verse 1 begins in chapter 21 of 1 Chronicles. It says, Then Satan stood against Israel, and he incited or baited David to number Israel. In other words, he's not sure God can handle this. And so what does he do? He decides to see how many soldiers he has just to make sure. God has already given him victory but David took the bait, man. He did not submit, therefore, to God. He said, in essence, you know what? I'm king. I'll do it my way. He took the bait, and the results were catastrophic. You can read it in 1 Chronicles 21. Thousands died because of David's pride. You know, even the great theologian Elvis said, wise men say, only fools rush in. <laughs> All right? <laughs> it's just a horrible idea. But if you insist on defending yourself, the Lord will let you.
David was so insistent that he knew better than God, God said, you know what? Have it your way. Let's see how it works out for you. How about when someone offends you? Like I was offended this past week. Folks, you got to let it go. It will eat you alive. Vengeance is an act- activity too hot for any of us to handle. Remember that. <clears throat> I have a fantastic book in my library written by a man named John Bevere called The Bait of Satan. And the whole thing is about the bait of wanting to get back at somebody who's offended you. Now, this is it's really a good book because we're all there from time to time. Somebody has said something said something to hurt us, said something to hurt someone we love. We live in that world. And Satan begins to plant the lure, the enticement, the bait. But Bevere actually quotes another author named Francis Frangipane who said, bitterness is unfulfilled rage. It just kind of boils and simmers until that lid just explodes like a volcano. Instead of just simmering every now and then, it just erupts. But in Romans 12, 19, God says, vengeance is what? Mine. Keep your hands off of it. Remember your place. Submit, therefore, to God, and then resist the devil. Because if you submit to me, that means you will have put on me and you will use not natural weapons, but supernatural weapons. Paul was hurt badly by a couple of guys. Look what he said to Timothy. He said, Alexander the coppersmith did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him in according to his works. Or the Message Bible puts it this way, the Lord will pay him back for what he has done. Man, if somebody's hurt you, offended you, offended someone you love, let it go. Do not touch what is not yours. Vengeance is mine. Is there ever a time for confrontation? Absolutely. So I'm not saying not to handle it in an appropriate way, but leave vengeance to God. Bevere went on, he said, your response to the bait of Satan determines your future. Why? Because, folks, we can choose our decisions, but we can't choose our consequences. Don't ever forget that. These are things you already know, but it's like Paul wrote to the um, Philippians. He said, it brings me great joy to teach you these things over and over again. Paul wrote in way of reminder. Peter wrote in way of reminder. We tend to forget, and Satan will make sure of that, right? That's why it's good just to write down some notes because you can look at them later in the week and just allow the Lord to bring them back to mind. And so you know these things, but it brings me great joy, not just to remind you, but do you know who else is learning and remembering as I'm teaching? Yeah, me. Don't take the bait. Lastly, on this point, if Satan can draw us into battle in our own strength, he has the advantage. Resist by submitting to the authority of Almighty God. So, the first two, we recognize that we're in a spiritual battle. Number two, resist. Don't take the bait. And finally, rejoice. Rejoice that Jesus has given us himself. He is our armor. He is our victory. Because of the cross and the empty tomb, man... Everything is different. C.S. Lewis said, The king of kings has faced the prince of death, and he has defeated him, and because of this, everything is different. Paul wrote in Romans 8, 37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors. Not just conquerors, we're more than conquerors and gain an overwhelming victory. Through him who loved us. Paul talk, begins his um, letter to the Colossians in Colossians 1.13. It says, For he, Christ, has rescued us and has drawn us to himself from the dominion of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom 
of his beloved son. And he didn't do this subtly or quietly. Man, he destroyed Satan and humiliated his kingdom. Look what he said, Paul, in Colossians 2, 13 through 15. He says, look, you were dead because of your sins. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all of your sins. He canceled the record. He's using legal terms now, things they can really relate with. He's canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away. He canceled it. He removed it by nailing it to the cross. It's what Jesus meant when he says, it is finished. Your debt is paid in full. He paid a debt I did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay, right? You remember the song, I needed someone. I needed someone. Thanks be to God for Jesus Christ. Look what he says in verse 15. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities those supernatural forces of evil operating against us. He shamed them publicly. He made a public disgrace of them by his what? His victory, having triumphed over them on or through the cross. In chapter 2, verse 10, Colossians, because of this, it says, Christ is the head over all rule and authority, over every angelic and earthly power. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 through 57, Paul, after writing about uh, our glorified bodies, that which is perishable shall be imperishable, right? And it grows to this climax. He says, death has been swallowed up in what? Victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, And the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why Paul could write from prison in Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It's why the following proclamation thundered from heaven as John must have looked on in terrifying awe. It says, then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the ruling authority of his Christ have now come because the accuser of our brothers and sisters, the one who accuses them day and night before our God has been thrown down. But they, us, overcame him by what? The blood of the lamb. Say the blood of the lamb. Yeah, not physical weapons, man. Spiritual weapons, not armor, but Christ is our armor. And by the word of their testimony, therefore you heavens rejoice and all who reside in them. Joy is different from happiness. Happiness is based on circumstances. Joy is based on truth. And it's why Paul was able to have joy while being incarcerated, while being beaten, while being castigated and vilified and gossiped about and tortured. That penultimate verse, but they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, never for a minute minimize the power of your story. Never. Sometimes, if somebody is hurting, if somebody is lost, they've never professed their faith in Christ. People love stories. And if you've struggled with something that they are struggling with, tell them, just tell them your story. Michelle and I have done that many, many times. After my son took his life, this ministry that we never wanted or asked for was given to us by God. And and we had the choice as to whether we would accept it or not. And we, we did. And so as a result, I don't know, I, I think I've spoken at about 15 public schools, two universities, Texas Tech twice, and then one time to hospital administrators, and I don't know how many churches, um, on what I call the suicide epidemic, um, awareness and intervention. And so 
every now and then, of course, I can't tell my story about Christ in the public schools. But here's what happens. Almost every time, if they have time afterwards, after I'm done, a line will form because they want to talk. They know somebody or they know some somebody who's taken their life or they, they know somebody who may be, you know. And one thing they ask is, how did you get through that? And then I tell them my story. Just real quickly, Jesus Christ. I couldn't have made it without him. I have this tattoo on my forearm. It's in Hebrew. My son had one like it. His said, die to self. Mine says, the Lord is my shepherd. I'll have people all the time. Hey, is that Hebrew? Or what? what is that? It's Hebrew. And what does it say? And I'll just tell them. I mean, this happens at restaurants and grocery stores. All I'll do, just while I'm paying my bill or whatever, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. That verse helped me not lose my mind when my son died. It's just your story, man. It doesn't have to be that dramatic like that. But your story, <laughs> I think about that guy who was blind and Jesus healed him. And those Pharisees, <laughs> they're just absolute idiots. They, they were so angry. They couldn't see. They didn't even notice the miracle. All they could see was that Jesus healed somebody on the Sabbath. They are so off course in regard to God's law. They just missed it. They're angry, legalists, critical spirits. Now, Jesus kind of disappeared, but they called that guy in. I mean, he's been blind all his life. And they tried to they tried to just beat him down and said, Who did this? And what happened? You know what he said? All I know is that once I was blind, and now I see. He just told his story. So don't ever hesitate just to tell your story. If you need some clarification, go home and just kind of write out a paragraph. And I guarantee you, within the next week or so, God's going to set up an appointment for you. You just tell your story. Well, this is a great proclamation by the theologian John Henry Newman from the 19th century. He said, Christ has broken the power of Satan, henceforth evil spirits, instead of having power over us, tremble and are terrified at every true Christian because of Christ. Listen, he shamed them publicly. He destroyed them. He tore them limb from limb. When they see a Christian coming, they don't want any part of you. They can't touch you. All they can do is try to, from the flank, fire an arrow. And I thought that's good imagery um, that Paul gave because that means um, he has to shoot from a distance, right? He can't get a hold of us. We'll get into that when we get to the breastplate of righteousness. He has no hold on us. He can just throw stones to try to weaken our faith. Well, let me close with this. Eugene Bartlett was a musician in the 19th century. He was in Missouri, and really, he was a talented guy. He, he kind of had it together. It seemed as if everything was just really going well for the guy. He married his childhood sweetheart, and he was selling thousands of copies of his music. I mean, the Lord was really blessing. Top it all off, he had two lovely children. I mean, it just seemed like he had the whole package, right? You just never know what a day will hold. Suddenly, in 1939, at the age of 53, he was struck by a paralyzing stroke, which left him unable to speak and walk. Now, everything is not Satan's fault. Hear me on this. I don't look for a demon on every doorknob, right? But here's what I've learned over time. Even if we're stricken by an illness, um, something as traumatic as losing a child, um, those 
human emotions that God has given us. Satan is an opportunist, and so he will quickly attach himself to those emotions. Does that make sense? He didn't cause it, but he is just looking for a chink in the armor. And so he'll quickly attach himself to it. So here's a man who had it all, and all of a sudden he can't speak, he can't walk, and he's bedridden. And no doubt, Satan came in like a flood, told him to give up. How could a God do this to you who claims to be good and loving? But rather than give in to anger or bitterness or despair, he made a choice, just like my family did, just like you do in regard to your own battles that you're fighting. We have to make a choice, right? He decided to write a song (laughs) that would represent hope and joy. Just like Paul in prison, he could have just shaken his hand to God and said, I'm done with you. David, in essence, writes that in his prayer in Psalm 13. I'm done. But he didn't. He thought back to his story. To when Christ saved him. Do you remember when you got saved? You don't have to remember the day, but you remember at some point in your life, Jesus changed you. So he thought about that and how much it had changed his life and the difference Jesus was making. At that very moment, even as he lay in bed, his circumstances hadn't changed. What had changed? He had. (laughs) And the mighty strength of God filled him. And Satan, no doubt, was shrieking as this man who was bedridden now fills with the awesome power of the almighty God and is being saved, filled with that same power as Paul told us in Ephesians 1, that incompar- incomparably great power, hyper, um, mega, dunamis, those words we get, uh, which is the same power that God used to raise Christ from the dead. And he is filled and Satan is repelled. He has to, he has to leave. He has to flee. <laughs> and so that man took a pen. And he wrote these words. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Sing it with me. Oh, victory in Jesus, I say forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Little did we know we got one of our most beloved hymns out of a man's extreme pain. Recognize we're in a spiritual battle. Physical weapons are of no value. Resist the devil. But before that, submit therefore to God. Remember our place. And finally, rejoice. Notice the verse I quoted to you earlier when Jesus said on the night before he was crucified, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome, past tense, even though the cross and the empty tomb lay ahead. I've overcome the world. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. Now, God, help us today, Lord, to be aware of your power. God, help us to identify our enemy, Lord, so that we might come not with the weapons of human strength, but the weapons of our warfare, which are of supernatural strength. 
God, help us as we leave this place to put on Christ, our new self, remembering that, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Lord, thank you that we have victory in Jesus. And we pray this in your name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming.